Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Pixel Feed Radio, and I'm here with my friend Leslie Hansel. Leslie, how are you doing today? Doing great, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. I'm excited to talk to you, actually. I don't get to talk to too many people that are involved with Amazon and all that good stuff. So Amazon is a different beast when it comes to marketing. So I'm always like excited to hear about it because the entrepreneur in me and the shiny object syndrome that I suffer from wants to dip in there, but I know I don't have the time and I don't know what I'm doing. So I know, I know it'll be a big waste of time for me, uh, at least in the beginning. But uh, before we get into that, for those of you that don't know, uh, Leslie, she's a co-founder co uh, for a, co a company called River. Oh my God, I can't even talk today. River Bend Consulting, and what they specialize on, they specialize on of helping people like you, you know, with um, setting up your your all your third party logistics, get everything in place. Uh, how do you pronounce it? ASIN, ASIN numbers. ASINs, uh, yes. ASIN, yes. ASIN numbers. Uh, you know, they deal with all the appeals and all that good stuff from Amazon. As we know, these it's not fun dealing with these companies. I get to deal with Facebook on a daily basis. It's not fun at all. Uh, virtual assistance, seller protection, the whole nine yards. So, and she started it uh, on her own, selling on Amazon. So, uh, yeah. So, first of all, before we get into all of this, uh, were you always an entrepreneur since so you were a kid? Were you selling stuff on the side? You, you always had a side gig at school? Not quite that long, but I'll tell you, not long after I got out of college, finished grad school, had my first quote unquote real job. Right. And I worked as a reporter and then I worked in agencies uh, doing marketing, public relations, that kind of thing. The mm -hmm. hours were just brutal. And I knew I wanted to have a family and I wanted to be a mom. I wanted to show up at the games. I wanted to come to the school plays, mm -hmm. be there when my kids got sick. And I knew that the demanding schedule of being a reporter or working at an agency, it's not the hours, it's the availability. So I wanted to have more flexibility. And that was when I started going out on my own, finding clients, finding gigs, I would still work more hours than most people that I knew, but I could work the hours I wanted to so that once yeah. I had kids, I could really be there. No, that makes sense. Listen, my wife, you know, she she's an attorney, so and we just had our second child this weekend. So oh, I get what you're saying. Thank you. Yeah, she wants to be able to spend time with them and stuff like that. So at one point, she's like, here's the ultimatum. I'm going to work from home and I'll take a pay cut. It's fine with me. But I won't, I'm not going to work crazy attorney hours anymore. So take it or leave it. And they're like, no, 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 we need you. And so and this is before the pandemic. This is before I, I still personally cannot believe that she weasel her way out of the office. I, I joke around, around it all the time because, you know, as attorneys, you got to be there. But that's, let's not go down that road. Let's go get back into the, the biz of Amazon here. So digital marketing, that makes sense. So you were exposed to digital marketing. I'm assuming you started to see people selling on Amazon and then you started seeing numbers and you're like, oh my God, I can do this, right? Absolutely. I started selling on Amazon about 11 years ago, which we joke that that's like being a grandma on the platform. Right? Yeah. <laughs> if, if people who sold for 20 years, they're the great grandmas and great grandpas on the platform. Right. Um, so then it was still kind of a wild west. It was really easy to source products, easy to get out there and start selling, easy to beat the competition because there just weren't as many sellers. There weren't as many products out there. Mm -hmm. And with each year that has passed, it gets more and more difficult, more and more expensive, and you really have to fight for the advantage on the platform. Right. And I mean, Amazon's a whole different beast when it comes to ranking and all that stuff. Like I just launched a new brand like a few months ago. And then one of my buddies like, you need to get an Amazon. Like that stuff, so we make it, we make the stuff ourselves. He's like, just get it on the handcraft uh, or artisan mm -hmm. Amazon or whatever it's called. Handmade. Mm -hmm. Handmade. Yeah, that's it. Because all our stuff is handmade here in the US. And um, I set up the account and haven't looked at it since then. That was like weeks ago. <laughs> so because I'm like, I just know once I get in there, I just logged it into the dashboard. I'm like, oh, my God, like, I don't I don't know where to go. Like, I don't even know where to start here. Uh, so it can be very intimidating. Even, even with someone like me who's been in digital marketing a grandpa, you know, I've been around it at a long, long time. Like I started running Facebook ads when they became public, like over a decade ago. So uh, that's what I feel comfortable with because I started when the platform was super basic and it evolved into what it is today. So, you know, obviously, you know, I'm so used to it. I can go through with my eyes closed, which I'm sure you can do the same on the Amazon side, right? 
Absolutely. It is really overwhelming. Part of it is because the seller central interface that Amazon developed, they developed it a long time ago yeah. and they really haven't done any major updates. So there's some cosmetic things here and there that they've improved, but it's not just that you're looking at a different platform than you're used to. You're also looking at a platform that's really old. And it hasn't been upgraded to the kind of wissy wig thinking that you are used to now um, yeah. on apps that are a lot more easy to navigate, easy to understand. Things aren't even easy to find. Oh, so no, I love this. Things are like, where's the freaking report? I, I talk to sellers who are some of the biggest sellers on Amazon, no joke. And I'll mention some report and I'll be like, have you been checking this report? And they're like, what report? Because it's so not um, yeah. intuitive. intuitive. Yes. Yeah, I logged in and I was like, all right, I'm going to put one of the products. And I'm like, we have over 200 SKUs. Like, I, I'm not going to sit here and upload one by one or hire somebody to do one by one. That's going to take forever. And then, like, I, you know, after digging for a week, I'm like, okay, I can, I guess I can upload a spreadsheet of like right. my products. Right. And I was like, okay, I'll get to that at some point. But, but it's the like, flat files are ugly and difficult to navigate. And they have a lot of terms in them that you will not understand. So a standard user, an average user, an average seller who looks at a flat file that they're going to upload their products, there will be columns in there that they're like, I, I don't know what that means. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not easy. I don't even know what half of it means, to be honest yeah. with you. I'll and these like, are smart I, I people. Know. These are not yeah. uneducated or not good sellers. It's just if you haven't used a flat file and you look, you're like, what the heck are they talking about? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like you said, I logged in and I was like, I don't even know where to start. Like, yep. I'm just like, okay, where's the like upload product? <laughs> like, there's right. no such a thing. It's like you have to dig in there. So so tell me your story. How? Okay. So you, you started selling on Amazon. What were you selling at the time? So when I started out, I was selling random stuff. And I mean, I was going to discount stores. This is back when retail arbitrage was so easy on Amazon. You wouldn't ever get in trouble. No one would ever complain about there being fakes or file IP complaints. So I would go to like every Tuesday morning where I live and find the hot Christmas item and buy as many of them as possible and flip them. And I would buy discount groceries. I bought everything back then. So I've narrowed things a little now to make it easier to sell. Now I have relationships with some manufacturers that I'm an authorized reseller. They actually ship product direct to the warehouse for me. That's awesome. So amazing. Yeah, I'm going to actually, I want to go back a little bit. So mm -hmm. when you found out about Amazon, what was the aha moment? Like, was it some client, a friend, somebody you knew? Like, did you just. Or it was just like, I can do this. And then that was your first instinct. I want to I want to hear the story of the first product that you flipped or, or you know, that's what right. I want to hear. Okay. So where I started out was library book sales. Okay. So 10, 12 years ago, used books were still super hot on Amazon. Certain harder to find used books are still hot on Amazon. You can still sell them like crazy. And the aha moment was when I figured out I could go to these library book sales where I live. A friend of mine had sent me a list of them. And they're like friend of the library sales where they get all these donations of books that I could go to these book sales and I could buy books for 50 cents and a dollar and I could flip them on Amazon and I could sell them for $8, $10, $12. And then the occasional hundred or $200 book, which is really exciting. Yeah. And at the time it was so much fun. It was like the treasure hunt, right? Mm -hmm. Like people who go to estate sales, which I went to a lot of estate sales too, um, that you, you go and you, you scan all these books and see what you can find. And you go for like a day or two on the weekend, ship all your inventory into FBA because these were early days of FBA, ship all those suckers in there. And then you don't do anything except provide a little customer service and they just sell, sell, sell. So that I, I call it semi-passive income. Mm -hmm. It's not really passive income because you still have to replenish your stock, but it's semi-passive because you work at it when you want to and you walk away. And I still do that now. My uh, my kids are involved in my business. My husband and my kids, they'll go and source. They'll find a bunch of stuff for us and we ship it when we're ready to ship it. And then we won't ship for another three, four months and it just sells away. And uh, in the meantime, I've got my manufacturer inventory turning. And so it's it's our semi-passive income. I love it. That's really cool. So when you're finding this stuff, like you mentioned, and you put it, you put the listing. So how do you get it to rank? Like, because, you know, 
Oh no, what happened? Yeah, I can hear you. You still there? I lost you in video, but that's okay. We can fix that later. All right. So um where were we? So when you're when you're finding when you find the products and you put them up up there, uh what how do you get it to rank? How do you how do you manage the listing so it ranks? Do you look at other people's prices? Do you do that? How does that work? There you are question and it really depends on the type of product mm -hmm. so for someone like me who is not a private label product seller i'm really focusing on sourcing products that already have a decent rank that already have a listing up there on amazon i'm not really going after exclusive items i'm going after things where there aren't a ton of other resellers i can find the product at a good price point and i believe that the rank is such that i'm going to turn over the inventory in 30 to 60 days now on the items that i'm selling for manufacturers in those cases if it is a new listing i'm looking at the things that they already sell and I'm figuring out if I believe that this new product that they want to put up on Amazon, if that is something similar enough to things that have a good sales history and that they're competing products, but that the brands I'm representing are strong enough that they can take some of that share from competing products, it's kind of an equation. So I sell some supplements, for example, and there's a supplement seller that wanted me to add a product that I looked at the competing products on Amazon from other brands, and they're just not moving any volume. And based on that, do I want to put up this new brand and make an investment in their inventory? Not really. But then no. they have other things where the competition, they're moving a lot of product. And since I rep a strong brand, I'm going to jump on that. So how can you tell the volume? Is that a native into the Amazon uh, dashboard or do you have like third party software tools and all that stuff that you can track all this stuff? So both, um, any listing, well, most listings on Amazon, anyone can look at that listing and they can see where it's ranked in that category. So something might be 1100 in health and personal care. And there are tables out there that you can Google and find really easily that'll tell you how many units that means likely sell in a month. And there's some great tools out there, software tools like Jungle Scout, or you can put in an ASIN and it'll tell you, we think that this product sells about 45 units a month or 70 units a month or whatever it might be. And you can gauge from the number of competitors on that listing, um, whether you think that you can actually sell some of those units based on their price and how competitive they are. Or if the competition, you're looking at their listing, you can look and see, well, I think if my brand is this much better or worse, my content is this much better or worse, I can move about that many units or more or less. Yeah, when uh, when I'm trying to get ideas to to go into a different brand new product or develop a new product, I haven't used this in probably years now, but I still have it. I can look at it on my browser. It's called Unicorn Smasher. I don't know if you heard of it, but you can go into Amazon and then you do a search for whatever product and then you click the extension and it will tell you exactly how many units have they sold and how long. I don't know how accurate it is, but it has never uh sent me the wrong way or steer me in the wrong way every time that i use it and i got I mean, like that sounds like crazy and then you know launch a funnel for it and it works every time so there's plenty of third-party uh tools out there that can help you with that uh, so all right so you were selling now it's a family thing how did the whole uh consulting uh business start it so i've been a consultant of one type or another for my almost my entire career, um, helping people with operational issues, marketing problems, public, public relation concerns. So then when I saw that people on Amazon were getting suspended and they didn't know how to get themselves reinstated, it looked like a really good opportunity. Reason being, when you get suspended from Amazon, there's lots of reasons that they will take you down. And what they ask for so that you can try and get live again, is a plan of action. And with that plan of action, um, they are asking you to show a root cause of why you got suspended and then explain how you're going to change your operations or oh your product God. or whatever that might be so that whatever you did wrong won't ever happen again. So as a longtime business consultant, that like speaks to me, right? That's my language right there. You're a so, saint. I don't know so how you the, have the patience to deal with that. It It is very frustrating. It is like the most frustrating um, 
like bad project you ever worked on in school. Uh, it was, what's really frustrating, hey, here's the crazy. The investigators at Amazon who review the responses, these appeals that you send in, they spend like two to three minutes per ticket. So, so that's you it. Will, you will literally spend days developing this beautiful plan of action and trying to actually solve the problem in your account. Sometimes, you know, these are multi million, multi 10 million, multi hundreds of millions of dollars selling accounts, right? And you write this gorgeous plan of action and you send it to them and then they write back and say, we need more information. Oh my God. And that's no. their whole response. Or they say, sorry, uh, you can't sell on Amazon. And it's, it, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of persistence to get it done. Yeah. I mean, Facebook is the same way. Google is the same way. Like for example, Facebook. Okay. I've spent millions on top of millions on top of millions with them between myself and, you know, clients, right? Mostly clients, obviously. Uh, and to give you an example, I posted a stupid ass meme on my personal profile, not about politics, not about COVID, none of that shit. It was just a stupid meme about being Italian because I'm Italian and everybody got a kick out of it. My whole family, my friends, I, I, we thought it was hilarious. So I got to tell you, I guess I got to tell you what the meme is. So it's a picture of a chef and the meme, all the, all the memes said it was like, Italians don't die. They passed away. And it was a picture of a chef holding a gun filled with pasta, like, like <laughs> and a pasta. And it was just hilarious. Right. I found it hilarious. So I posted it on my personal account a year and a half later, a couple months ago, my account gets flagged. My personal, like my personal profile that controls all these client accounts gets flagged from the personal side. Needless to say, four reps, multiple chats, like my VIP rep could not do anything about it. It was locked by the system. It's like banned for 30 days. I reached out to like people in, you know, top places that I knew and knew people on the inside and they still couldn't do anything about it. It took me over a month to get my account back. And it's just like, it's frustrating because it's like, you make these people millions and it's still nothing. It's like nothing. It's like, you know, it's nothing in their bucket of billions. And it's like, they just treat you like somebody who doesn't spend any money. I'm like, dude, this is how I make my living. Like I need access to all this stuff. But this is why I have multiple backups all over the place. So, but I learned my lesson a long time ago. It's, well, I'm it's just as frustrating on your side, I'm assuming. Amazon has the same attitude. Amazon is very much like another seller will step in with that product. Another seller will okay. come and resell that item or have a private label product that is just as valuable. Um, they really do not value sellers almost at all. Uh, there are some sellers that have some unique selection that they care about. And the, beyond that, um, yeah, we, we work with some of the largest sellers on Amazon and their accounts still get suspended. That's how I meet most of them is that they are taken down, even they do, though they do hundreds of millions of dollars a year on Amazon uh, because of some violation. And a lot of times it's a very minor violation. And they never tell, they never make it clear to you. You ask them, it's like, what did I violate? Well, this one they told me, but you know, it's like half of the time they don't even tell you. It's like, well, you broke so a with rule. Amazon, yeah. With Amazon, you don't ask because if you ask, they a lot of times will just block you because it's almost like Sh you should know. Yeah, <laughs> the and then you go read like, the rules. You should know. So like, I don't even know what the word is that I'm looking for. They're so like uh, not uh, vague. There's nothing specific. It's like, well, don't use personal attributes. Uh, okay, well, personal attributes could be a million things. Like. What did this specific this ad? What rule did I break in this ad? Because I'm to me it reads fine, but something in your AI is picking it up and flagging it, and then you know it's like I'm getting frustrated. <laughs> it's well, just and see, it's, about it. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing with Amazon as with Facebook. There are so many false positives. Mm -hmm. So e example with each Facebook, my corporate account got shut down on Facebook for. Um, for selling real estate. Okay, so we do these Facebook lives and and talk to people about Amazon. Real estate is not something we ever talk about ever. We use no real estate type words in anything. Mm -hmm. And and they they keep flagging us for selling real estate, which we yeah. are not doing. So same kind of thing on Amazon. This year there have been 
thousands of products that were kicked off of Amazon for false positives related to pesticides and medical claims and all of this other stuff related to the pandemic, any kind of product that had a medical claim. So an example is for a while, they took down all the face masks at the very beginning of the pandemic. But when they took down masks, they also took down beauty masks. And they took down Halloween masks and they took, you know, any mask, they took them all down and it's all false positives. And then you're like going back to them yelling and screaming and saying, Hey, 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 wrong thing. Your, your technology is wrong. And, but it takes like three and four times to get them to listen. It's very frustrating. What's frustrating to me is like, just tell me what I did wrong so I can fix it and we can move on. Like, I'm not trying to break rules here on purpose. Just tell me. And then I can learn from it, fix it and move on. Like, I mean, it's not, I mean. It's different because it's just an ad that's getting flagged or keeps getting flagged or whatever. But, you know, once your whole account goes down that, you know, Facebook's very famous for like taking your account down and not even asking questions. It's like it could be the dumbest thing ever. And then, you know, you keep trying to get it back again. I'm lucky now that I have reps and all that. But before, if you don't have reps, forget it. You're going to get the AI answer. It's like, oh, we can't do anything about it. You're never getting it back. So always have backups. That's all I can tell you. Right. Um. But it's different on Amazon because you have a seller reputation and all that stuff. So even if you have backups, that still sucks. Well, and especially if you're a private label seller, because if you have your own brand of product that you've developed over time, you have a lot invested in that product, you can't just magically create another seller account because they're going to detect that because you were the only one selling that brand and then you're shut down and all of a sudden someone else is the only one selling that brand. They're going to link the two and and suspend the second account. So if, if it's a private label account, especially that account is critical and it's got to stay clean and it's got to stay active. So obviously you deal with these nightmares, which is I'm sure it's worth every penny. (laughs) (laughs) I will gladly pay it. Uh, What about account account management? Do you you guys do account management as well? Like manage the whole account where people can just send the products and how does that work? We don't manage the entire account. That is not our bailiwick. Uh, we refer that to partners and other companies that we do know do a great job. But what we do on the, what people would call management is handle a lot of the day-to-day torture of your Amazon account <laughs> that people don't want to deal with, especially smaller businesses where you know the people in the business need to be focused on logistics, landing product manufacturing and making deals. They don't need to be answering customer service messages, figuring out why their inventory is stranded for no good reason. They don't need to be appealing ASINs that got taken down and spending time with the back and forth of that. All the all the day-to-day hassles of the account so we can take care of that for them. Um, and usually the time that they free up by outsourcing that to us, they more than make up for it with, you know, they make one good deal and we're more than paid for it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so let's talk about, you know, since you're an expert when it comes to Amazon, if I was starting out today, let's just say I just woke up today, you know what? Screw Facebook, screw everything. I don't want to deal with any of it. I want to just go to, I don't know, thrift stores and bookstores and whatever and sell stuff on Amazon. How do I go? How do I start? Because, I mean, I don't know what to look for or whatever. So, like, how do you start if you wake up today and want to do that? So I hate to say this, but it's gotten really risky to mm-hmm. sell stuff that you find in thrift stores and bookstores and that kind of thing. It okay. used to be a really great way to make a living on Amazon. Now it's very limited. The mm-hmm. reason is because a lot of stuff that you will flip with RA that are popular items are things that the manufacturers will go after you with IP claims. Uh, it gets really ugly really fast. However, if you have a little bit of business savvy, Um, I'll tell you my coolest, best strategy that I've told people that has been used again and again by people I've told, and it like totally works. Where you live, there are office parks filled with little companies that make products and they sell them. And a lot of them, they don't sell them online. They sell them other places, or they might sell them on their own website. They might sell them on Shopify, or they just sell to local stores, or they ship to retail stores. A lot of them want to be on Amazon. They don't know how. You go to those office parks and you walk in and talk to people and say, hey, I'd love to rep your brand on Amazon. Um, You can negotiate incredible terms with them. You can get stuff at better than wholesale price. You tell them you're going to get their content up. You're going to get them brand registered. Uh, You're going to have beautiful A-plus content, take some nice photos. 
help them to really sell online, but they're going to take all your returns back. You know, you, you, you get terms that work for you and for them. You go and find yourself two or three of these little companies to rep on Amazon. You've got a solid business going really fast. So what about fees? Um, so what's the average order value that's worth it to sell on Amazon where you make money and takes care of all the overhead per sale? That's an awesome question. And a lot of this depends on if you're doing FBA versus fulfilling it yourself. Most people want to do FBA. That's where you ship everything into the Amazon warehouse and then Amazon fulfills the order. But when they do that, they take a hefty chunk of what you've made on that item. So you don't want to really sell onesie, twosie, $5 items, FBA, because the fees eat everything. If you have small light inventory where you can get a price of around, say, $18 to $25, then FBA is actually a great deal um, because they can flip a lot more volume than you can or want to shipping, right? Because you don't want to pack that many boxes in one day. Uh, so if you can find small and light items that are, you know, $18 to $25, bucks, that's a really nice sweet spot. Uh, where you have to be really careful is when items start creeping up in dimension or weight. There are calculators out there, including on Seller Central, that'll tell you what the fees are going to be based on the weight and dimensions of a product. If something's super heavy or if it's really big, it's not something you want to do FBA. That makes sense because then, I mean, the shipping fees are going to be ridiculous and you got to eat them up, huh? And the storage fees at Amazon and their handling fees, all of it. So you got, okay, so Amazon has storage fees, handling fees, obviously. And what any anything else hidden commissions there's, or anything like that? Well, there's the pick and pack, um, which is a per item fee, and then there's their sales commission. Um, but on the where it matters on the dimensions is the storage fees and handling fees, uh, because the bigger the item is, the more they're going to charge you, and that goes for both weight and size. So let's just talk about ballpark. So what I don't know. Let's say you're selling, a, I don't know, a book. Like what's, if a book is 20 bucks, what are we talking about? Just a ballpark. You still have any idea. What would the fees, when you put them all together, what would it be on that $20 item? A good ballpark on things that are not oversized is 35 to 40%. Okay. So, I mean, even if you had your own Shopify store, your own brand and stuff like that, by the time you factor in advertising overhead, manufacturing costs, and, you know, unless you're Nike, you know, your average, you know, your average, uh, profit it's going to be somewhere on there so that makes right. sense i mean it's yeah not, i guess it's, it's fair not enough. terrible it's not terrible you know if, if they're taking 40 percent, i know that sounds like a lot but that includes the pick and pack and the shipping because mm -hmm. they get better shipping rates than you could ever dream of getting oh, of course yeah. and then and then the storage fees if you've got stuff that's there for 60 90 days you know you would have to have a unit somewhere with all of your stuff in storage um so really it's not uh, people complain a lot of, of, about fba fees and i get it it is a lot um but especially if it's a side gig or an entrepreneurial venture that you're doing alongside another venture, it's worth it to pay for FBA. Now, if this is going to be your bread and butter every day, maybe you develop some way to fulfill your own product and you do it cheaper, better, faster. But if this is a side gig, oh no, you can't. And, and listen, you're going to still pay the, around the same on overhead and all that stuff. Employees. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, I'm sure the people who bitch about it is because they never had an actual business of their own where they had to pay all this money. To, you know, it's, it comes about the same again, unless you have a product that's like, you know, a pair of Air Jordans where you're selling for like 300 bucks and they cost like $3 to make. I mean, right. that's, you know, <laughs> which yeah. listen, you can do it. If you can make your own thing and you can slap a label on it, you can charge whatever you want for it. I don't know if people are going to buy it or not, but you know, that's, listen, I'm a big fan of doubling and tripling your prices. Like when people come to me, I look at their stuff, I'm like you make this. Yeah. That's the only one in the world. Yeah. Why, why is your price so cheap? Triple it. And they're like, what? I'm like, triple it. And sure enough, you got to cover your costs and you got to make money. Like, you know, it's, it's all about marketing. It's all about marketing. So that's really cool. So, all right. So we got that covered. Um, what about, how do you choose if your product ships out on prime or not? Because I noticed when I'm shopping on Amazon, sometimes I'm like, why isn't there some prime? Isn't that like sitting at the warehouse? How does that work? Because that, like, I always wonder about that. Or is it because people fulfill it on their own and it's not sitting at the warehouse? Right. So almost everything that's sitting at an Amazon warehouse that's FBA should be offered prime. Occasionally there will be something that isn't. Usually it's because of the size of it. 
or if they've gotten down to a very small amount in stock. So if there's a very small amount in stock and say there's one unit in the West Coast and one on the East Coast and you're in Nebraska, they may not offer that prime to your location. Um, but you know, 95% or more of the stuff that me as a, as a seller ships into FBA should be available prime except for little technical exemptions. Uh, for a while, Amazon had a very robust seller fulfilled prime program where sellers like me could ship prime. Uh, it, it, you just have to live up to certain standards that they have for delivery speeds. They've made it very difficult for third party sellers to ship prime. So now only a very small percent choose to do so because you have to offer a lot of one day, which as you can imagine, is mm -hmm. extremely expensive and prices most people out of the market. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. In, Almost everything that is that is shipped and sold by Amazon.com, so Amazon's retail operation that they purchase from vendors, almost all of that is Prime. Uh, you will see exceptions on things like clothing um, and also on large items because anything with a whole lot of variations, it gets difficult. Uh, yeah, so those, those are your usual Prime exceptions. So most of the stuff, it'll say ships, so it might be sold by me and shipped by Amazon. Um, but some will say sold by me and shipped by me. So those are those uh, non-prime items that are being shipped by the third-party seller. Okay. The other question that I have for you, because I actually had to deal with this one time and it was a pain in the ass. So I was wondering, can you explain to me how that whole acing thing works? Like, how do you find the serials? Because somebody, like we make our own products. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, we have to assign number. I'm like, I don't even know where to start with that. I never had to do this before in the past. So how does that work with the ASIN numbers? Do you buy a batch of them through Amazon or somebody else, and then you assign them to your item? How does that work? It's actually much simpler. Um, they j it's one of those things that seems difficult, but it's actually automatic. So if you create a new product in Amazon, you create the listing, you write out the title, you add the photos, and you hit create listing, it will automatically generate an ASIN for you. Has always been, has it always been like that? Because I remember one time looking into it and I was like, I have to get these numbers from somewhere and assign them. Now they will ask you for a UPC. Um, if Maybe it is something, UPC. if it's something handmade, I, I don't think they will ask you for a UPC. There are times where you can ask for an exemption to UPC. Um, mm -hmm. So they ask for some kind of an identifier, right? Like a GTIN or UPC, uh, yeah. but, but the ASIN is automatically assigned by the system. Okay, cool. That's good to know. So, you get everybody covered when it comes to Amazon. You, you help them out with all that stuff, their accounts and all that. But you also have something called Project Retail. So I want you to tell me a little bit about that. So Project Retail is where we totally go against the grain and do the opposite <laughs> of what everyone else is thinking about. <laughs> because everyone's talking about how to take their products online, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, there are a lot of sellers out there on Amazon that they sell on Amazon only. They have products where they have only sold on Amazon, never sold anywhere else. Um, some of them are now developing their own D2C, like on a Shopify store, but they are still pretty much just Amazon because you can't drive the traffic to your Shopify store like you can to Amazon most of the time. It's just a reality. Uh, but we've got a lot of sellers who they have some super winning products and they've got the numbers to prove it because they can show massive sales numbers. They can show their rankings over time, all this good data that they have. So we are helping these sellers to take their products and scoop up their winners that are on Amazon and introduce them to traditional brick and mortar retail stores. So you guys do all you contact the, the purchasing people and all that? Absolutely. So there's there's actually a lot to it. It's pretty complex because, for example, uh, your packaging on Amazon isn't the same as you're going to have in a retail store because right. you didn't focus on packaging. You didn't have to catch someone's eye. You don't have to have case packs that are to a standard that a certain store would want. You don't have hang tags. So we help with everything like the packaging and design to make sure it's retail ready. And then, yeah, we actually go to the buyers at the stores and have a lot of relationships that a lot of the big chains out there um, and go talk to them and say, hey, I've got this brand, check out their line of products. We think these would do particularly well in your whatever department uh, and approach the different departments and um, try and get test buys and get them placed in the stores. It's really exciting. Uh, I've actually been quite surprised. We launched this in January and it's going 
really a lot better than I ever expected. They're, the buyers out there are hungry for products that have data behind them because they get approached every day by people who are like, put my product in your store, but they have no sales history mm -hmm. and no data. So we can serve up all this great data. And then we've got the retail experience background to make the great deals with the retailers that the, the online guys, they've never sold in a retail store. And so they, they don't know how to make the deal. So we just bring together both sides of that equation and get those products pushed out there. So when you're talking to these people, because like we're thinking about reach, uh, reaching out to some retail, uh, you know, uh, chains or whatever, what's the minimum they're looking for on, on sales to have a conversation that, you know, would be worth looking at or having a relationship. So like sales history. Yeah. So it really depends on where you've been selling. Um, if you're out there on Amazon, we're looking for products that are ranked. You know, if we can find something that's ranked top 100 in a category, we're feeling really great about it. If it's top 1,000, we can definitely take a look. We're also going to look at product reviews and see first if the reviews are real. And then... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if the reviews are real, um, the quality of those reviews, those are super important as well, reading that actual feedback. Um, so a lot of times they want to see some sales history that's two or three years if possible uh, for the brand, for the entire brand. Right. Um, but, but newer products, if they're exciting, if you've got a patent, if you've got new technology, something totally different, they'll look at stuff that's newer with less history. So let me ask you something. So what's when you say top 100, top 1,000, how many units a month are we talking about there? Just to have an idea. Oh, gosh, it really depends on the um, on the category, but you should be moving a couple of hundred or more units per month. Um, most of these products are moving a thousand a month. A thousand a month. OK. All right. I'm just trying to get an idea for the people who are listening that they have Shopify stores, like, because I get asked all the time, like, should I take it to retail? I'm like, well, if it's selling, why should, you know, I would. Uh, but the last time I, I had an experience with retail, it was a product that was moving like millions of dollars. So it was different. It was like, yeah, like we have to back it up, but there's people out there who are like, what's the bare minimum that I need to move into retail? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> like I've only done it a couple of times and it was like established brands. So I was wondering about that. Well, and sometimes also it depends on your willingness of what you you are willing to try, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of times we can't get you in the door. Okay, if you want to get into Walmart, great. But I can't get you into every Walmart in America tomorrow. But what I might be able to do if your product isn't quite as exciting is get them to do a drop ship test. Um, because with the drop shipping test, there's very little risk to them. If you've got something with a stronger sales history, they might be willing to actually do a test where they are purchasing the inventory, but they're only selling it online, right? right? So with the dropship, they have no risk because they're not even purchasing the inventory. So there's all these different levels of what we can go into someone with to try and convince them to do the deal. And a lot of it does depend on the strength of the product and also the availability of your inventory. The, the biggest problem with someone who's had relatively low sales turnover is that they won't have the kind of inventory available that the stores want if they want to make the buy. Right. So you got to, you got to be able to fill those purchase orders. And if you don't, you're going to get hit with fees too. Right. And the, <laughs> and the strength of your relationship with your manufacturer, uh, the kind of relationship you have with them, the kind of credit you have with them. Um, you know, if they're, if they're in America, that is a huge plus right now, like a tremendous plus, like you wouldn't believe right now because we can't get product, not us, but you know, companies cannot get product landed from China in a timely manner right now. Yeah. Um, so all of these variables can come into play so even if you have a product that you may not think would qualify in the past but you've got a strong relationship with a made in america manufacturer there's an opportunity that's really cool all right leslie we're out of time man this went by super fast i can't believe it listen thank you so much for coming on uh where can everybody find you when should people start looking for your services and i will put all the links in the description but let them know where they can find you Awesome. So please check us out at riverbendconsulting.com. We have a phone number there. You can click with actual people who will take your call all oh, day man, long. You're a brave soul. You're hey, a brave it's, soul. It's a big deal, especially in our industry. People are panicked. Their account goes down. They need a human to talk to. Yeah, I get we it. have we have a staff of 60 people. Someone is going to pick up the phone and talk to you. Um, and there are forums there where you can email us as well. And if you want great content about Amazon, 
this on five days a week, follow me on LinkedIn. And it's under Leslie Hensel, L-E-S-L-E-Y-H-E-N-S-E-L-L on LinkedIn. Um, I love to accept connection requests and I write about Amazon all the time. Happy to answer people's questions there as well. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking at your uh, LinkedIn account right now. It's stacked. I love it. Yeah, she posts all the time. That's cool. I do. Listen, Leslie, thank you so much for coming on. This was awesome. And uh, hopefully I'll have you next time soon, sometime soon. But I'm going to need to talk to you about the new brand. I don't want to talk, uh, go to Amazon. So I'm going to do that. But uh, awesome. everyone, check out the links in the description. Smash the like button, subscribe. And I will see you guys on the next episode. Thanks again.